Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for coming, and thank you for having me at First Year Experience. Um, I still so fondly remember my own freshman year Common Reads program, so I, I think it's really great uh, that I get to you know, be here and speaking to all of you. Um, homegoing began for me in 2009, though it probably began much earlier than that. I don't know if there is ever a clearly defined beginning to the work of novel writing, but setting that aside, in 2009, I received Stanford University's Chapaluji Scholarship. On the undergraduate website, the scholarship is described as one that, quote, provides funding for full-time immersive projects in the humanities, creative arts, and qualitative social sciences during the summer after your sophomore year. I had applied for the scholarship with the hopes of beginning a novel. The other day, I found my grant proposal in my old files. And though it makes me cringe a little to read things I wrote when I was a teenager, <laughs> I'll share just a bit of that proposal with you now. The novel is to be set in both Ghana and the United States and is told through the perspective of a teenage daughter who is trying to understand the complexities of her relationship with her mother. The novel includes stories that the mother has told the daughter about her time in Ghana, evoking a sense of both Ghanaian landscape and culture. Miraculously, someone saw fit to give me this scholarship, even though later on in the proposal, I go on to more or less admit that I had no idea what I wanted to write about. To that end, unsurprisingly, when I got to Ghana, I felt completely lost. I was staying with my aunts and uncles and cousins who had been warned by my parents that I was incredibly shy, an artist type who was not too keen on talking or people. <laughs> because of this, my family in Ghana treated me more or less as though I were mute giving me lots of space and encouraging me to write in the little green journal that I was keeping. I was miserable until a friend came to visit and by the incredible force of inertia that such visits can produce, asked if I would like to go see the Cape Coast Castle. For those of you who don't know, the Cape Coast Castle is a slave fort that still stands in what is now known as Cape Coast Ghana. While many people, when thinking about the history of the transatlantic slave trade, think of Great Britain as the main colonial power, it is interesting to note that the castle was actually first built by the Swedes, then taken over by the Dutch, and then taken over again, finally, by the British, where it became the seat of British colonial rule in the Gold Coast. My tour of the castle, which took place only a few days after the Obama family's tour, and therefore was surrounded with much fanfare, was the experience that informed the creation of Homegoing. On that tour, the guide spoke to us about how the British soldiers who lived and worked in the castle at the time used to marry the local women. From there, he took us down to see the dungeons. And I wish I could describe to you what it felt like to stand in those dungeons. They still smell. Even though centuries have passed, they're still covered with grime. The death can't be washed away from those walls. I knew that day in the castle that I wanted to write about this history. But over the course of the seven years that I worked on this novel, my project grew and grew. In part, I think, because the more I wrote about and studied the past, the more concerned I became with our present. And the more I thought about the present, the more I started to see how inextricably tied it is to our past. For those of you who don't know, Homegoing is a novel that follows the family lineage of two half-sisters born in Ghana in the 18th century. Afia, the first half-sister, is the wife of the British governor of the Cape Coast Castle. Essie, the second half-sister, is kept in the castle as a slave before being sent to America. The novel then follows down the line of Afia and Essie's descendants, 
one offspring after another, ending in the present day. In the early days of writing this novel, I used to describe the structure as a fishtail braid, two sections feeding into each other, one after another, after another. The beginning of the novel was quite clear to me from the start. After that day in the Cape Coast castle, I knew I wanted to juxtapose the lives of two women who had lived there, one as a slave, the other as a wife. This was the literal upstairs-downstairs dichotomy. I didn't know at first that they would be sisters, and I didn't know at first that I would follow down the lines through to present day. In fact, because I take notes about my writing process as I write, I can tell you the exact date when I realized that Afia and Essie would be related. It was September 5th, 2012, three years after I had already started the novel. In that day, on my notebook, I wrote, so say that Afia and Essie have the same mother. One gets sold into marriage, the other into slavery. This could all come out in the prologue, or this could come out in their two stories. Now you all have some insight into my very refined process, which basically consists of making it all up as I go along. There is no real record of the lives of the people who pass through the Cape Coast castle, through the dungeons at Cape Coast. They couldn't tell their stories themselves. One of the great challenges of writing these early chapters was that I usually only had a few facts to ground me. The rest of the time, I was relying on imagination. For a fiction writer, this can be freeing but it can also be anxiety-making. With Afia and Essie's chapters and characters, I hoped to honor the many Gold Coast women who had passed through the Cape Coast castle. But I knew I couldn't stop there. I knew that the history didn't stop there. As I researched, I was struck repeatedly by the gaps in the history. One book that I used was incredibly helpful. Uh, it was called The Door of No Return by William St. Clair, and it helped me to imagine the early chapters of Homegoing. It laid out the Cape Coast castle in a way that made me able to see it. It had a chapter on the women, a chapter on the children. What was noticeably absent, though, was a chapter on the slaves and the dungeons themselves. While researching the period of the Civil War, after the Civil War, in order to write H's chapter, I stumbled upon a Douglas Blackman article titled, From Alabama's Past, Capitalism Teamed with Racism to Create Cruel Partnership. It's a very long title. The article talked about a man named Green Cottenham, who was arrested, charged with vagrancy, and then leased to the U.S. Steel Corporation to serve out his sentence in the coal mines of Birmingham, Alabama. This article led me down a rabbit hole of research about the convict leasing system. And the more I researched convict leasing, the more frustrated I became, not only by the horrors of what I was learning, but by the very fact that I had never learned it before. Convict leasing is as much a part of Alabama's history as anything else I'd learned about in my years as a school child there, and yet it was absent from my textbooks. This question of why we learn what we learn and how we learn what we learn became an obsession of mine and forms a kind of invisible backbone to the novel. In a 2015 article for The Atlantic, Michael Conway looks at the way that we are taught history. He says, currently, most students learn history as a set narrative, a process that reinforces the mistaken idea that the past can be synthesized into a single standardized chronicle of several hundred pages. This teaching pretends that there is a uniform collective story, which is akin to saying everyone remembers events the same. Yet history is anything but agreeable 
Conway's assessment feels true to my memory of my early history classes, where we learn about good moments versus bad moments. And yet, I would argue that learning all of the history, the good, the bad, the complicated, and textured, makes us better citizens, citizens who are capable of thinking for themselves, deciding for themselves what they want to believe and why. As James Baldwin said, to accept one's past, one's history, is not the same as drowning in it. It is learning how to use it. An invented past can never be used. It cracks and crumbles under the pressures of life like clay in a season of drought. I didn't start out wanting to write historical fiction. In my family, my older brother was the one with a love of history, and I was the one with a love of fiction. It wasn't until writing Homegoing that I started to realize how intertwined those two things could be. For me, Homegoing did not begin as this theoretical exploration of the problems with how we think of and talk about history. It started because I was so fascinated with our present, and I had a nagging suspicion that the present is not distinct from the past in the ways that I had been led to believe it is. To quote my favorite writer and thinker, James Baldwin, once again, history is not the past, history is the present. We carry our history with us. We are our history. When I started the book, it was much more traditionally structured. It was a book about two black people, one a Ghanaian American immigrant, the other an African American, who were navigating race in America today while looking back at the lives of their ancestors, two women in 18th century Ghana. I thought this would be enough, but as I worked, I started to feel as though I was taking the easy way out by not structuring the novel in a way that allowed me to follow the legacies of slavery and colonialism as they shifted gradually over time. In many ways, this novel is a response to those people who say things like, Slavery happened a million years ago. Why can't you just get over it? I'll close today's talk by reading just a tiny bit from the last chapter of Homegoing, Marcus's chapter. I like reading from this chapter because it most closely reflects my experience of writing this book. Marcus is a PhD candidate in sociology, and his struggles with this research is what relates to my struggles with writing. A month passed, and it was time again for Marcus to return to his research. He had been avoiding it because it wasn't going well. Originally, he'd wanted to focus his work on the convict leasing system that had stolen years off of his great-grandpa H's life. But how could he talk about convict leasing without also talking about his great-grandma, Willie, and the thousands of other black people who had migrated north fleeing Jim Crow. And if he mentioned the Great Migration, he'd have to talk about the cities that took that flock in. He'd have to talk about Harlem. And how could he talk about Harlem without mentioning his father, the stints in prison, the criminal record? And if he was going to talk about heroin in Harlem in the 80s, wouldn't he also have to talk about crack everywhere in the 80s. And if he wrote about crack, he'd inevitably be writing, too, about the war on drugs. And if he started talking about the war on drugs, he'd be talking about how nearly half of the black men he grew up with were either on their way into or out of what had become the harshest prison system in the world. And if he talked about why friends from his neighborhood were doing five-year bids for possession of marijuana when nearly all of the people he'd gone to college with smoked it openly every day, he'd get so angry. He'd slam the research book on the table of the beautiful but deadly silent Lane Reading Room of Green Library of Stanford University. And if he slammed the book down, then everyone in the room would stare, and all they would see would be his skin and his anger. And they'd think that they knew something about him. And it would be the same something that had justified putting his great-grandpa H in prison, only it would be different, too. <laughs>
less obvious than it once was. When Marcus started to think this way, he couldn't get himself to open even one book. Thank you.